Hello everyone, it's Tuesday, it's 3 o'clock, that means it's Tech Tuesday. Today's topic is what cable operators are doing to increase the upstream bandwidth in their cable plant. Be right back. Thanks for joining me. Ricky Uzi here with the Quorum. So, um, Cable operators have had to uh, do some interesting things over the years to try to increase the amount of upstream bandwidth that they have in their cable plant. At, at one point, um, upstream bandwidth was not important at all for anybody, right? Because everything we were doing pretty much, other than making small requests, was everything was coming down to us. But um, you know, over time, that need for upstream bandwidth has increased. And then it was really seen um, during the pandemic as we had suddenly a lot of people at home that were not normally at home. Uh, you had students that normally would be at school that were at home doing schoolwork. You had parents uh, that were at home, dads or moms or whoever that normally would have been at work that were suddenly home and then working from home and not just working from home and consuming stuff, but they were uh, on Zoom calls. So there was a lot of uh, upstream video that was going out in addition to the normal stuff that people were doing. So we, we suddenly saw there was a big increase in the demand of upstream. There was a big increase in the downstream demand. But upstream increased significantly more as far as the percentage of, of bandwidth that was needed. So that was seen. And cable operators also have to take into account that they've got more and more fiber operators that are competitive threats to them, either already in their area or possibly think about overbuilding their area. So cable operators are thinking about what, what can we do to get at least closer to parity as far as the kind of speeds we can offer. Um, symmetrical speeds are going to be difficult, but there's a lot left in DOCSIS 3.1 that can greatly increase the uh, speed of, on the upstream side for a cable operators. While it might not be symmetrical, it will increase the speeds. And symmetrical is not needed, really. I mean, there's nothing special about having the same bandwidth up or down. It's more of a marketing checkbox for the most part. Still, most of what's being consumed is, is coming down to the consumer. Um, and uh, you know, there's plenty of downstream bandwidth that can be available through DOCSIS, and there's uh, plenty of upstream bandwidth right now that can be available. All cable operators are going to be moving to fiber in the future at some point, but they're trying right now to do what they can to make the most out of the investment that they've got in the ground right now, their HFC plant, you know, hybrid fiber coax plant that they're trying to make the most out of. So there's different things they can do. So I thought I'd cover this today and uh, just talk a little bit through this. So. Uh, where did my presentation go? Right now you see a blank screen. I'm not sure why. Uh, let's see here. Let me just start this again. Well, there it is. Okay, for some reason it popped up. Okay, so, uh, you know, as before, as I've, I've talked about kind of technical things like this, I'm not going to go real deep because I'm, I'm not the kind of person that can go real deep on these topics. I'm not uh, an engineer or anything like that, but I think I can, one thing I can do is I can, uh, hopefully make it understandable for those people where this is, you know, they have some knowledge of it, but they want to know more about it. They've heard about these things. So hopefully I can help there. So again, that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so let's see here. There we go. Good. So the first thing I wanted to cover was um, just how things got started and primarily because I'm old. <laughs> so I remember this, but it's also, I think it's an interesting topic and it's kind of how things got started because again, in the cable world, Originally, it was just TV that you were consuming, and there was no need for any upstream traffic. Uh, there was a period there where they were trying to do some interactive things where you might have something like a special remote where you could maybe vote on stuff, you know, and just send little small signals. So, but then uh, as the internet, you know, as the internet started to progress and people were on dial up and they wanted to get faster speeds, then cable companies, um, you know, really drove this, this two way kind of plant was uh, broadband, not, well, let's call it broadband. Yeah, broadband at that time, we'd be considered broadband or high-speed internet. Uh, and what was driving that was, that was that need. So the first way that we had kind of this two-way plant was uh, telco return. And the way it worked was you had your traditional kind of head end here with your CMTS and your backend servers that were doing DHCP, TFTP, time of day kind of stuff that are needed to deliver that service and your traditional HFC delivery method here and a cable modem in the, in the customer's home. But this cable modem also had a 56K modem in it, uh, integrated in it, or it could have had like a separate modem that it, it could work. In some cases, they did that. Then basically on the other end of the house here, you know, basically in the same head end, you had traditional dial-up internet kinds of 
technology. You had a radius server, that's the server that would do the authentication of the, the dial-up modem, the username and password that dial-up users would use. Uh, then you had your traditional access server, basically your box of modems that, again, a traditional dial-up pop would have, point of presence. Then you're doing just like, again, a PPP or point-to-point -point protocol connection uh, on this end through the phone network. So basically you're doing like a dial-up connection here and a cable modem connection here. And this was just for the upstream traffic. So um, there wasn't at this point really much upstream traffic to worry about. It was mostly requests because you'd go to, a, you want to go to a web page and you would, uh, you know, type in the name and then you have a DNS request going upstream to the, to the authoritative name servers or your caching name servers. And, but then it would come down, everything would come down this fatter pipe right down here through the HFC network. So that's kind of how it got started. But it, you know, it didn't take long before, um, you know, this upstream was, it was very constrained. A lot of people at the time were upgrading from their dial-up service, so it wasn't bad for them. It's like, well, you know, I'm still, I, st I still can't do stuff very fast upload, but I'm doing a lot faster on the download side. But eventually, you know, people got tired uh, of waiting a long time. Maybe if they were uploading a picture or sending something, sending a big file, uh, or they wanted to, you know, if they needed that immediate, you could email something and it could kind of go in the background. But if you need that kind of immediate uploading a file to see something, that was a, a big pain. So, um, you know, and DSL came out and it was faster at the time. It was faster on the uh, upstream as, you know, in addition to you have the downstream kind of speed. So so that that changed and we needed more. So that's when we started getting to these um, different splits. Uh, but first off, actually, we had, uh, I want to talk about frequency division duplexes. So this is kind of how we went to a two-way RF plant. So at first, the RF plant could not uh, support um, packets going in both directions. So everything was designed to go only in one way, and that was downstream. So they had to come up with a way to do it um, over the same piece of coax cable in both directions, and, and it could support that. But what they had to do is they had to basically swap out their uni unidirectional amplifiers for bidirectional amplifiers that would then transmit the packets in both directions. You had to come up with filters that would separate those, uh, those packets. And then what they did was, Basically, it's like you had two lanes of traffic. It was just over the one coax. And you had this broad spectrum that you were using, and you were using the bulk of the spectrum for your, it looks, this, it looks even here, but really the bulk of the spectrum would be, let's say, for your downstream traffic. And then you had some, you know, you had some spectrum that you had, a, had allocated for your upstream traffic. And those lived in different areas. And there was a, you know, a diplex filter would separate basically those two. And then you can send traffic in both directions over the same piece of coax. So... That was the next step. Um, then you've got today, we got different kinds of splits. And I think one of the first traditional splits was what's now called a subsplit. Um, I don't know if that's what it was called back then. I can't recall. So you have basically on your upstream, you've got 5 megahertz to 42 megahertz. And that's, that's the amount of spectrum that's allocated for upstream traffic. And then on the downstream, um, starting at 54 megahertz uh, on up from there, depending on the, you know, what they did with the plant, and again, in that gap in the middle, 42 to 54, that's where you have your kind of your crossover zone where you're separating those two streams of upstream and downstream traffic. Then uh, today we see a lot of providers, and a lot of this again started to kind of, more people were t doing this during and after the pandemic to try to increase the amount of upstream because they saw the real need there. So people started doing mid splits. Um, I'm sure some were doing that before that, but basically that that would take you from 5 megahertz up to 85 megahertz. So you can see you're um, adding quite a bit of upstream there. And then on the downstream, started at 108, and then again goes up from there. And then uh, high splits, uh, this is something that fewer are doing this, but there are some that are doing this. The high split will give you even more upstream. So you're there, you're again, starting, let's say, at 5 megahertz up to 204 megahertz. So again, you've got a lot more bandwidth now on the upstream, and then on the downstream starting at 258 and on up. Uh, there's a good, uh, yeah, there's a good slide here that I got this image from Cable Lab. So here you can see that kind of represented here. Again, five, and here's your 42 to 54. That's your diplex filters, as you see here. So that's kind of your crossover zone. Uh, then you've got 54 on up. Here you've got five to 85, and then 104 on up to 750 megahertz or up to a, a gig. And then you've got your high splits, um, again, 5 to 204. You've got your uh, crossover area here where your diplex filter is. Then you've got 258 up to 1 or 1 1.2 gig. So this is on your um, 
linear high split. And you, get, you can see as you increase the amount of bandwidth uh, that you've, you're going to have more, I think probably more energy going through here. This is probably why you've got to increase this area that you've got kind of uh, set out, set apart to be able to be this crossover area where you've got these diplex filters. So they're having to block out that area. And then you're using this for your downstream and that for your upstream on that. Um, now, what's you know, this is another uh, example of showing this here. And there's something interesting here as you get into this high split. Uh, one thing that cable operators need to worry about is they need to worry about leakage in their cable plant, not only because it causes them problems. If you've got signal that's leaking out, that means signal can leak in, and that's going to make their cable plant noisy, and that's going to make uh, the performance, that's going to reduce the performance of the cable plant. Um, especially in the upstream as everything funnels back to the CMTS. So that's a problem for them, but it's also a problem for the FAA because uh, you've got an aeronautical band here. You can see 108 to 137 megahertz that needs to be, you can't have any leakage in this area that's significant because you'd be interfering with uh, aeronautical kinds of uh, the air band as they call it. So uh, when this was on the downstream, it's a little bit easier to handle this because everything was coming from a centralized source. You've got your CMTS that's broadcasting everything downstream to cable modems. So you've got that centralized source and you can, in, you can inject, uh, you've basically got a signal that you've got coming down and it's all going all over the place. And then you can take your field test equipment. Uh, if you injected some kind of signal, maybe at the CMTS, you could go down and find that easier because you just want one place where you can get that signal out and then it's getting distributed throughout the cable plant. Well, when you turn it around, then suddenly you've got all these cable modems and they're all communicating upstream. So there's not a, there's not a centralized place where everything is going upstream. Everything's distributed and then going to a centralized place on the upstream. That's why the upstream could get so dirty is because um, everything funnels to the CMTS. You've got all of this. If you've got any noise coming in the plant, again, if you've got uh, ingress points, that noise is getting in, that then all congregates, all that noise kind of can, gets contributed into one big noise block that heads up towards the CMTS and that can cause problems for folks. So, uh, so this presents a problem here is how do we go ahead and then uh, make sure that we can test for any leakage here. So there's a really interesting thing that uh, they've come up with. Uh, there's something called OUDP, which stands for OFDMA Upstream Data Profile. So it's a I guess a nested, nested acronym. It's an acronym within an acronym. So OFDMA, that's, that's the, uh, the DOCSIS 3.1 kind of addition for, um, on the upstream. It stands, that stands for orthogonal frequency division multiple access. So it's a little different from OFDM, which is orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. This is multiple access. So you've got OFDMA, and then on top of that, or in addition to that on the acronym, you've got upstream data profile. So basically, OUDP. And what that is, uh, that provides a, a method for cable modems to do this um, test burst. It's an OUDP test burst, and I believe it's like 138 megahertz, so it's right above this uh, aeronautical band. And um, what they've determined is that if, as you've got all these cable modems that then can do these test bursts from all over, that can be measured by test equipment, especially because, again, it's in this 138 range, which is right near where you're wanting to measure for, then um, traditional kinds of test equipment where cable operators walk around and test on the downstream, they can use that same type of equipment. They might need to you know, update some firmware to be able to read the same kind of interference on the upstream because of the fact that you've got all these cable modems out in the field that are uh, transmitting this OUDP test signal. And they're having to transmit, I think, pretty, you know, it's got to be pretty high gain, I think, uh, due to the size of this. So. Um, Again, this is an interesting way to get around this issue. So this originally was uh, one reason why people were doing mid splits, I think, and not high splits, because there was this challenge here. But now I think the test, test manufacturers have come out with the ability to now look at these OUDP kinds of signals and then check for leakage that way. Um, now, then there's extended spectrum DOCSIS. So this is part of the DOCSIS 4.0 um, 4 spec. So ESD or expanded, extended spectrum DOCSIS is basically taking that same um, division duplexing, but it is giving you more. It's basically just expanding lanes even further. So, you know, it's like adding what they want to do is they want to get more on the upstream 
So in order to do that, they need to get more on the downstream so they don't have to borrow from the downstream. They basically increase the, the full spectrum that you can do, and that way you can get more data on the upstream. Um, for example, uh, again, extended spectrum docs. Some people call this an ultra high split. Some call it frequency division duplex or FDD, which is kind of confusing because that's really what they've been doing this whole time. Frequency division uh, duplexing is, again, just separating those upstream and downstream channels with this diplex filter and then sending everything down the same cable, but in different parts of the spectrum. That's what you're doing. So, but they call this FDD or frequency division duplex as well. Um, and that's, I think you've got full duplex, FDX, and then you've got FDD, full division duplex. So that's kind of how they're referring it sometimes to the extended spectrum DOCSIS. That's those two acronyms. But um, I like extended spectrum DOCSIS just because it doesn't get mixed up with uh, what you're actually doing anyway, which is FDD. So uh, on this, you've got upstream 5 megahertz to 300 megahertz or 396 megahertz or 4 492 megahertz or 684 megahertz. So 96 megahertz in between all of those. And, and you can see that you can get really high here on the upstream, and then the downstream, you can go up to 1.82 gigahertz, and I think even further, uh, you know, they're, they're talking about even further than that as well. So that would be extended spectrum doxis. So there are two, um, basically two paths that were being looked at for the next version of doxis when doxis 3.1 was out. They were saying, what, what are we going to do next? And they were looking at this extended spectrum doxis, and they were looking at full duplex, and there were people kind of on both sides, you know, some were saying, no, we really should make it full duplex. And others were saying, well, we really should do extended spectrum doxis because full duplex is going to take big changes in the cable plant, maybe down to node plus zero and lots of, you know, lots of changes that a lot of people can't do. So uh, there was arguments going back and forth, you know, kind of Betamax, VHS kind of thing, you know, which way are we going to go? And, and Cable Lab said, well, you know what, we're going to put them both in doxis 4.0. So they're both in there. They both have specifications. They're both supported. And now those are two choices that uh, folks can make under the DOCSIS 4.0 spec. Um, see here, this is just another, um, this was just from Comcast showing what the extended spectrum DOCSIS could look like here. And here they're going up to the 396. And then you've got uh, your downstream right here. And here you see uh, full FDD, again, that acronym FDD enabled bandwidth OFDM downstream here. Uh, what do we got here? DOCSIS 3.1 to 4.0 bandwidth OFDM downstream. So this is kind of falling in your DOCSIS 3.1 range and even DOCSIS 4.0. Um, here you're looking at basically DOCSIS 4.0 and uh, FDD. And then uh, the other path is full duplex, where that's where you've just, you got your piece of coax and you're not separating the upstream and the downstream into different parts of the spectrum. Basically you're using the full spectrum and sending data back and forth. And there's a cancellation technology in there that lets the packets go back and forth without uh, serious collisions. So you can obviously greatly increase the amount of uh, usage that you can get on the spectrum if you're able to transmit both up and down over that same spectrum. Um, and this is something that, again, there was, there was a concern about um, having to have a node plus zero kind of architecture, which means that you would go fiber um, all the way out to a node that would then be coax with no amplifiers after it to the customer. So basically, um, no amplifiers in the network, node plus zero amplifiers. And that's very expensive because most cable operators are not there. They've got amplifiers out in there. Some of them have got nine amplifiers, you know, some have got uh, seven, you know, six, four, whatever. But they've still got a lot of amplifiers out there. And that means taking those out having to extend your fiber deeper, and you're getting closer and closer to being fiber to the customer at that point, fiber to the curb. Uh, so Comcast has been going down this road. That's what they've been looking at. Most of the other MSOs have been looking at extended spectrum DOCSIS. Uh, but something interesting that came out at the uh, SCTE show, which I talked about the other day when I was doing a couple of news stories, you see here, Comcast completes DOCSIS 4.0 puzzle with amplifier test. So basically, uh, they were able to, with this with this amplifier uh, able to do a node plus six arrangement, which is I think what most of their plant is at least node plus six. So they can do a full duplex over node plus six infrastructure. So six amplifiers in there. Um, and that's using special amplifiers that can actually do full duplex or actually handle that full duplex kind of technology 
Originally, uh, the thought was that was going to be in the node, but apparently these amplifiers can do the full duplex, and that way you can have amplifiers in the in the plant and uh, still do full duplex. So these are the things that uh, cable operators are doing. Again, this was just meant to be a very high level kind of look at uh, cable splits and what cable operators are doing to increase their bandwidth, both on the downstream and on the upstream. So again, their challenge is that uh, there's customer demand for this because the you know what we're doing on the internet has changed. So they've seen this again, it's a real world situation where they've said, you know what, we need more upstream bandwidth. So they're they're doing those things uh, as far as these mid splits and high splits and looking at extended spectrum doxes. They also would love to be able to do uh, symmetrical, to be able to put a little checkbox that says, hey, we can do one gig symmetrical too. And um, the uh, the 10 gig, the, or 10, not 10, not, yeah, is it 10 gig? Yeah, the 10 G, <laughs> the uh, Cable Labs 10 G initiative is supposed to be for 10, 10 gigs uh, symmetrical up and down, but it looks like maybe that's gonna be more like 10 down and maybe six up. I don't know if anybody's really thinking they can do 10 symmetrical, but obviously they, they can get lower, you know, maybe they could do six gig symmetrical, which is still really, really good. Now it's not like 10 G pond. So again, they still, they're still going to be behind on what fiber can do because fiber, you know, over glass shooting, shooting the signal over glass can be much, much easier, much more reliable than doing, uh, doing uh, coax for any part of the plant. But the challenge for cable operators is, uh, to, it, in order to go to fiber to the, the home, they, they need to rip up a lot of that architecture that's already in there. A lot of that coax architecture and all that stuff's got to be taken out. You've got a big disruption as you then uh, have to swap out all of the last mile infrastructure that you got for all your customers. So they're trying to avoid that wherever they can. And they can. Uh, they can really squeeze a lot out of uh, DOCSIS 3.1 and then going to DOCSIS 4.0. This will help them depending on the amount of competition that they have, this will help them uh, be able to, to use that legacy infrastructure that they have for some time. You know, it could be just a couple of years, but it could be 10 years or more that they're able to use that in certain areas. Eventually, uh, they will start overbuilding themselves with fiber. Some are already doing that. Um, some operators are doing that. Who is it? Altus USA is, is overbuilding themselves. They're overbuilding their HFC plant with fiber plant. Others uh, like Comcast and Charter are in their existing areas upgrading to um, DOCSIS 4.0, either extended spectrum DOCSIS or full duplex. They're looking at that. They're uh, doing these mid splits, these high splits. And um, in greenfield areas, they are putting in fiber because that makes sense there, right? Why, why put in additional HFC infrastructure when you can just go fiber to the curb? So they're doing that in the greenfield areas and they're actually getting funding to do that. So a lot of them have submitted uh, you know, for funding requests like RDOF and like ARPA and those kinds of things. And I'm sure they're going to be doing this with the uh, BEAD program as well. So they'll be looking at doing that. But that's their plan is to, for most of them, is to make the most out of their cable plant that they can now. Greenfield is fiber. And these other areas, they're going to uh, upgrade them if it makes economic sense to do that. If it doesn't, there might be some places where they're like, you know what? With what we have here and the age of the equipment and what we would need to do to upgrade, maybe we should just rip it out and do fiber in some places. So it'll depend. But for the most part, that's kind of the direction that they're going. And I think that will that will keep them competitive as long as they are providing good service. As I've said before, if you provide good service to somebody and there's not a compelling reason for them to leave, if their speed is fast enough, it doesn't have to be symmetrical. It doesn't have to be 10 gigs. It could be you know, less than a gig and be more than enough for somebody. The thing is, if you've got a competitor in there that's pushing that how fast their speeds are and symmetrical, that's something you got to take into account. But if you're providing good service, if your pricing is competitive, uh, if you provide good technical support, uh, then people don't have a reason to leave and there can be not that many people leaving just because something looks shiny and bright. Um, they will, they, they need a reason to leave basically, so. Anyway, thanks for joining me. And don't forget, if you need help with anything, um, we, especially if you're a cable operator, we have tools that can help you increase the performance of your cable plant. We've got TrueVision uh, Diagnostics. Uh, we've got TrueVision also works for fiber if you're a fiber operator. But then also on the DOCSIS side, we've got Proactive Network Maintenance with Pre-Equalization Analyzer. And that application actually will significantly help you reduce maintenance costs and it will help you improve the performance of your cable plant. You can find ingress uh, at customer homes by looking at that tool. There's uh, ways that we can show you which homes are actually transmitting uh, noise into the cable plant to in increase the performance of your upstream, those kinds of things. So check
check us out. You see our website and email address there or give us a call. Thanks for joining me for Tech Tuesday. I will see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.